Hello, my name is Mike Bach, and I'm an adjunct professor in the horticulture department at the College of DuPage, and I teach our introduction to beekeeping class. And today I'm going to talk to you about bees in a variety of topics. I'll cover four particular areas. I'll give you a brief overview of the Western honeybee, the most commonly used commercial bee. I'll talk about some beekeeping history. I'll talk about some modern beehives that are in use today. And then I'll finish with a slide on why you might want to consider beekeeping yourself as a hobby. Now, when you talk about bees, there are actually thousands of species known around the world, over 20,000 known species of bees. But the amazing part is that there are only seven of them that are honeybees. And honeybees are unique because they store honey, which allows them to overwinter as a colony or to survive in lead times. No other type of bee does this. And honeybees are found on every continent in the world with the exception of Antarctica. They're everywhere you have insect pollinated flowering plants. And when I talk about beekeeping, I'm really referring to organized beekeeping. That's been around since at least ancient Egypt or Greece. Now, the most dominant uh, honeybee we're gonna to refer to is the Western honeybee. And that's Latin word, apis mellifera. Apis is bee-like, mellifera is honey. So it's a bee-like honey-loving insect. But what you may not realize is that the Western honeybee is not native to North America. It actually arrived with the settlers in Virginia in 1622. And it was called the Western honeybee to differentiate it from its Eastern cousin, which is Apis serrana or the Asian honeybee. Now that spread around the US actually as the settlers expanded. And it's interesting because the Native Americans who were here, when they started noticing honeybees in their area, they knew that settlers probably weren't far behind. And they actually had a nickname for honeybees. They called it the white man's fly. And the dominant bee that came across at that time was what's called a German black bee. And that was the dominant bee up until about the mid 19th century when steamships were invented. And that enabled rapid transit across the Atlantic Ocean. And that opened up a wave of diverse and unregulated honeybee importation that's never been seen before or since. But this particular bee never really won the hearts of beekeepers. It was well suited to the climate here in North America, but it would sting a lot. It was also prone to disease like American fowl brood. And frankly, it's doubtful if it even exists in the United States anymore. Maybe only a genetic ghost of it Imported parasites essentially wiped it out. Up until about the 1970s, you could occasionally find a wild hive of German black bees, but no more. Now this shows you kind of the distribution of apis, the honeybees around the world. And the apis mellifera, the Western honeybee is that area in red. And as you can see, they're pretty much all around the world. The other colored areas on there represent the other six types of honeybees out there. The blue area is the Apis serrana, uh, the Asian honeybee. Now, the difference here between the Eastern and Western honeybee, the Western honeybee, the hive population gets up to about 50 to 70,000 bees at its peak in the summer. The Eastern honeybee is only hive sizes of around six to 7,000 bees, much, much smaller. And when we're talking about the Western honeybee, the go-to bee, the number one most popular is the Italian. It's a golden brown color with dark brown stripes. It's actually the perfect bee for new beekeepers because they're very gentle. That makes them easy to work with. They're also very productive. They produce a lot of honey. They produce a lot of good honeycomb. And that's key for a brand new hive. They also have a long tongue, which allows them to collect nectar from a wider variety of plants. They also have good disease resistance, which is another key positive. Now we show issue here is a huge population. That's a blessing and a curse. They actually build up populations quickly, which can lead to very productive hives that store a lot of honey. But they also are prone to swarming, which I'll talk about here in the next slide or two. They also have larger winter colonies, meaning there are a lot of bees in the hive over the winter, which means you have to store more honey in there for them to live off of over the winter. The second most popular type of bee is what's called the Carnolian. This was brought over from the Slovenia, Austria portion of Europe, it's kind of brown gray in color with lighter brown stripes. And it's good resistance to brood disease like foul brood or chalk brood. It's also adaptable to a variety of climates, which is a huge positive if you're a commercial beekeeper and you're moving your hives around the country. All that really means is that if they get into an area where there's lots of good forage, they'll build up populations quickly to take advantage of it. 
And the converse is true. If the forage isn't so good, they'll slow down their growth so they don't have so many bees that they have to feed. They also live longer, which might be handy in overwintering and summer bee populations. And their smaller winter colonies are good because you need less stored food to actually make it through the winter. Now the issues are they swarm. Now you think, what's the big deal with something like swarming? Swarming means that uh, two thirds of the bees in the hive essentially leave with the current queen. They go fly away to find another home. And that leaves only a third of the bees that are originally in your hive and they wait for a new queen to hatch. But that new queen hatches and she's not likely laying new eggs for two weeks or more because she has to mature, she has to go on her mating flight, then she has to develop eggs. And that's a long time with no colony growth. If that happens in a brand new hive and they swarm, your hive may not recover it enough to make it through the winter without a lot of intervention on your part as a beekeeper. The last one I'll talk about that is generally in, in common use is a Caucasian. It's actually from the Caucasus region near the Black Sea. It's kind of fallen out of favor today with backyard beekeepers. It's good production, it's a gentle bee, but it actually creates a lot of propolis. Now propolis is sap from trees and the bees go gather it and bring it back to seal up cracks in the hive. This particular bee not only does that, but it coats everything in the hive with propolis, so it makes it very sticky to work. It's also prone to nosema, which is the most widespread bee disease. Essentially, that causes the equivalent of dysentery in the bees. It dramatically weakens the hive and the production, and it happens typically in the spring after a long winter confinement. It's also prone to robbing, uh, which means that they won't bother making honey on their own. They'll find another hive and try and steal honey out of it. And if you have a bee yard with multiple hives and one of them's Caucasian bees, you could have a lot of brawls in your bee yard between hives as these bees try and steal honey. Now there are other bees out there. Uh, you know, some other examples are Russian bees. In the 1990s, there were efforts to find bees that were resistant to varroa and tracheal mites and Russian bees seem to be the winner in this. They have very small winter colonies it might be worth exploring at some point, but they're not too widely available right yet. There's also a buckfast bees, which are a hybrid bee created by a Benedictine monk named Brother Adam. It's uncertain of its heritage, but uh, it's thought that it's a mix of British honeybees as well as some other bees. Lots of fans around the world, uh, but they can rob and they abscond from hives, which means they just abandon the hive out of the blue. They're also harder to find, and any you do find, the authenticity of them is actually questionable. There's also cordovan bees. They're used in research because they're easy to identify. They're very bright yellow, but they're not particularly good honey producers, and they don't do well in cold, wet climates. But they're real pretty. Uh, if that's what you want, there are breeders available for them. And then the last one, this is probably the most uh, contentious. These are what are called Africanized, or you know, the nickname is killer bees, and that's all misleading because all it really is is a Western honeybee that essentially lived in Africa where they had a lot of animals that tried to rob hives. And so these bees evolved to be very defensive. They would attack in large numbers if their hive was threatened. It's because they had to, to survive. And in 1956, some researchers brought some of them to actual South America for research and some of the Queens escaped. And they've steadily been mating with local populations and their genetics have moved north ever since then. They defend in large groups, they swarm more frequently, they really don't make that much honey and they make less wax. Now, that's not a problem up here in the Northern United States because genetically they can't handle cold weather. They don't overwinter well, so they die. But they do exist in the Southern United States. And typically when they find a hive that apparently has a lot of the genetics associated with these types of bees, they destroy them because they hurt crops and they kill people occasionally. So now we'll transition a bit to some beekeeping history. And you have to understand that people really figured out honey thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. They would find the hives, they'd steal the honey and they'd get stung. But the idea of organized beekeeping is very different. This is where people realize how beekeeping worked. They set up hives and started moving them around to follow the flowering crops. In Egypt, it was actually up and down the Nile River on barges to the different crops that were growing. And you can see some pictures here. The top right, you can see that's actually a log, a hollow tree. 
because bees primarily in the wild are tree dwelling insects. Honeybees are tree dwelling. So back when they started finding hives, they would cut the tree down and they would saw up that section of that tree and then they would bring it back with them. And that's what they had for the hive. Um, the middle picture here is an apiary that was uncovered in an uh, archeological dig in Israel. So people had apiaries like this with multiple hives. The bottom right is a, a replica of an ancient Greek hive made of clay. The issue with all of these is that it's very destructive to the comb and the hive. Essentially, anytime you wanted to get the honey out, you'd hack all the comb out of the hive and you'd crush it. And you'd kill all the baby bees in there and you basically destroy all the comb, which takes a lot of effort for the bees to build. So many times the hives didn't survive that. The most common older hive style that people used for approximately 2000 years was something called a skep. And it's an inverted basket essentially. And it was probably inadvertently discovered. Someone left out a basket and a bee swarm found it. So take a look at the pic here, the picture on the bottom right. I, I wanna point out a couple things here for you. Look at the variability in the actual honeycomb the bees built in that space, the, all the different shapes that it comes in. But one thing I want to highlight for you is look at the space between the honeycomb. It's consistent no matter what direction they go. That's an important concept that I'll talk about in the next slide. But these particular hives also meant, you know, you have to destroy the hive. You have to hack all of that honeycomb out of that basket to get the honey. Very, very destructive. These are not used anymore. Essentially, they're mostly banned in the United States because disease is hard to control and you really can't easily inspect these. So about the mid 18th century, that started the design of what we call modern hives. And they tried to focus on how can we more easily remove that honeycomb? How can we minimize damage to that honeycomb? So the hive has a better chance for survival. And so people started experimenting. They probably put some bars inside those skeps, but that didn't fix the comb destruction issue. And that work continued and a key innovation responsible for modern hive design was the discovery of that B space, it's called. That's that gap, that consistent gap of six to nine millimeters between honeycomb in which bees would neither build more comb or cement it closed with propolis, that tree sap. And that led to the development of the three hives pretty much used today in modern beekeeping. The Langstroth hive, the Warre hive, and the Topar hive. The Langstroth, by far is the absolute most commonly used hive. And the Wari and Top Bar, they're less expensive to set up, but they still have issues where you have to destroy comb actually to get honey. The Langstroth, you do not. So this Langstroth hive was developed in the mid 1800s by a gentleman named Lorenzo Langstroth. And basically it fixed most every issue they had with previous hives. It took the attitude that we need to work with bees and to support their natural tendencies. So it used hanging frames, as you can see on the top right, they would hang inside the hive box and that basically made it easy to remove them or replace them as necessary. It also used bee space. It made those frames a very specific width. So you'd have a honeycomb, the perfect depth on both sides uh, on each of these frames to make it very easy for honey extraction, easy for the bees to raise their babies. It was also multi-stories, as I'll show you on the next slide, to take advantage of a honeybee's natural tendency to store extra honey up high. And it's the most commonly used today, as I've talked about. So when you look at a Langstroth hive, and a, here's a diagram of it for you, and I'll review some of the elements of it. You have your stand at the bottom, a hive stand. This one shows it as wood, but a lot of people use cinder blocks or other types of stands. But then you have your bottom board. That's actually like the floor of the hive. And at the front of that bottom board is the entrance where the bees go in and out of the hive. Above that, you have what's called a deep super or hive body. Most hives have two of these. This picture only shows one but you have two. And this is where the bees raise their babies. The queen lays 1,500 to 2,000 eggs every day when they're building up populations. And this is where they store honey, they store pollen, and they raise their babies in these two uh, deep supers or hive bodies. Now, as they fill those up, that's when beekeepers jump into action and they start putting on what are called honey supers on top. These are a little more shallow, 
Uh, all of these have eight or 10 frames, depending on the size of the box. And the honey supers are where the bees store their extra honey up high. And you see something in between called a queen excluder. Not everybody uses these. these. Essentially, just think of it as a grid, a, a kind of a mesh grid that has gaps in it that are big enough for worker bees to make their way through to go up higher, but too narrow for the queen to go up high. You want her to stay down in the hive bodies, laying eggs down there where there's lots of space. And you want the bees to store extra honey up top in the honey supers, because this is what a beekeeper takes off at the end of the season. And you could have one honey super, two, you could have up to five honey supers on there, depending on how productive the year is. Each of those will yield about 35 pounds of extracted honey that you can use. On top of that, you have the inner cover. Uh, and then on top of that, you have your outer cover. That's called a telescoping outer cover, which actually overhangs the top of the hive to keep rain out from the inside of the actual hive itself. So with that, I'll summarize, you know, why might you want to consider beekeeping as a hobby? Well, tops on that list is saving bees on our planet. Bees are critical to our world and they're under increased pressure from disease, parasites, and environmental issues. And honeybees play a role in pollinating 30% of our crops and 90% of our wildflowers. Good pollination leads to better cropping, and that's feeding not just people, but especially all the many animals, birds, and insects that rely on wildflowers. Maybe you have your own garden and you just want to make sure it gets well pollinated. Honeybees absolutely produce much higher crop yields in gardens and in agriculture. Maybe you just want to extract that honey or the pollen or beeswax and sell it to people you know or give it to them as gifts. Maybe you like to educate others on beekeeping like I do. Maybe you're just looking for a hobby that's very relaxing for some stress relief. Whatever your reason, I encourage you to get involved with this wonderful insect. Maybe even sign up for our introduction to beekeeping class here at the College of DePage. Thank you very much for your time today.